Hello and welcome to News Click for today's coverage of the US elections. Presidential elections seem to have been settled with Trump in clear lead. He has already got 277 electoral college seats, which is what has been declared by AP. Of course, the final counts, final results are still some uh, time away, but there's no question that Trump is going to win this election and he's going to win it convincingly. But by looking at these results, and even the ones which have not been declared at the moment, you're talking of only what the press has declared, not the election equivalent election commission of the United States, it seems Trump is going to not only win this election, but will, will, will win it handsomely. So all this talk about being a very close election, it's a toss up between the two, doesn't seem to have held. So what really has happened? Yeah, so the as you can see, uh, according to AP, Trump has crossed the 270 mark, which is required to win the presidential elections. Which is because he's won Wisconsin as well, right? which is the last uh, seat that they have called. So the, in the US, the elections, uh, the presidential elections go by uh, electoral college votes per state, right? Now, uh, out of the 50 states, there are only seven states which where there was a doubt, right? And swing states. The swing states. Uh -huh. So they were called the battleground states. Uh, that's the, what the media would call it. And so if, if we look at the, um, the, of the seven battleground states that there, there, there are three in the north. So there's Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. And these were called the blue wall, um, the, uh, Biden's blue wall. Uh, Biden won all three states last time when he won the 2020 elections. Before that, in 2016, Trump swept all three, right? And so these are the these are demographically very similar states. They're in the Rust Belt, the the uh, the industrial states of the glass areas. Etc. Etc. Yeah, so they were the old industrial base of the US, yeah. right, which have now been hollowed out because of all the outsourcing that has happened. And um, then are the four southern states, uh, which is called the Sun Belt. So this is North Carolina, Georgia, Arizona, and Nevada. So these seven were supposed to decide the US elections. The fate in these seven states would decide which candidate would win and which candidate would lose. In the last elections in 2020, outside of North Carolina, Biden won all of them, Six. all of them, right? Um, so North Carolina was the only one which went for Trump. Now in 2016, when Trump won, outside of Nevada, he won all of them, right? Now, um, so, so it's, so these states seem to swing towards the, uh, the winner. The uh, expectation this time was that, uh, well, according to the opinion polls, all these states were within one percentage point. Uh, one percent, half percent. Uh, yeah. With Kamala Harris leading in a few of them, losing in a few of them, but all of them very close. Mm -hmm. to each other. Very close to each other, and um, and like they were going up and down. Like in September, uh, once Kamala Harris was announced as the candidate, she seemed to be leading, but then over October, that lead had shrunk and so all so the 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 opinion poll aggregators right people who take all the opinion polls and average it out they were more or less saying that it's a 50 50 election right so but if you take nat silver for instance he said his gut told told him that kamala harris was losing and trump was winning yeah and the argument behind that was that the kind of polling which was being done that was biased by the pollsters in favor of one of the candidates, Kamala Harris, that their sympathies, in fact, was reflected in the way they sort of polled well, the people. Well, Nate, Nate Silver, in that same thing, he said, my gut says, but he, say, he also said, don't trust anybody's gut, including mine, <laughs> right? Yeah, so, right. Know, he was hedging his best. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, what is interesting was that amongst one of the most, Nate Silver ranks polls according to their accuracy, and one of his top-rated polls is the New York Times Siena poll. Uh, and in the last version of that, uh, they said that again they were more or less neck and neck, but Kamara Harris was slightly ahead in kind of four or five of the states. The interesting part was, as a footnote to that opinion poll, their own people, um, the New York Times people, were saying that there is a potential problem with the poll that 
Republican voters were getting far more difficult to reach, right? So, so most of these polls are uh, polls are phone surveys, and what they found out was uh, that people who they know were registered Republicans, when they would call them, they were less likely to pick up the phone. So they had to call many more Republicans to get their to to get the balance with the Democrats, and which they felt was strange, right? Because what what it meant was that people were shy. Or, or what's called the Bradley effect, people were embarrassed to, to express their support for Trump. And uh, so, so that was one indication. The other indication was in the early voting. So typically in the early voting, uh, Democrats uh, like uh, kind of get the majority of the votes in the early voting. Well, primary, the, one of the reasons is that at least in the last election, uh, Trump was against early voting. And so Trump was like early voting is equivalent to uh, uh, the, the million ballots are equivalent to fraud and all that, and so so he was against them. So the early voting was was overwhelmingly democratic, but this time around, it wasn't so overwhelmingly democratic. And it is not just that the Republican turnout was higher in the early voting, which is to be expected because Trump was not so much against early voting this time around. But the Democratic early voting numbers had fallen in, in some states fairly significantly. So I think those two indications were. Like we felt, even like there was a gut feeling that Trump would outperform what the opinion polls were saying, and which is the case in both in 2016 and in 2020, Trump had outperformed what the opinion polls had said, and and so they, that when the opinion polls were saying 50-50, you had this suspicion that sneaking suspicion that actually Trump would win. Yeah, that that is one. But you know, let me take a step back in all of this. Uh, Democrats have also lost the Senate and also the Congress. So all the three wings of the government, as it is, is now going to be with the Republicans and particularly with Trump winning the presidency, a really relatively much more aggressive Republican right wing, as it were. So this is one part of the picture. But the second part of it, and I think this is something that I would like to discuss with you, that, you know, there is something that the Republican Party is very clear about. They have a core constituency, they appeal to it. And Trump also has a clear constituency, which he appeals to. The, you can call them what you want, the misogynistic uh, voters, the basically white disenfranchised, those who think they're disenfranchised voters, but really a racial majority. And he's been always appealing to that. This time he has got minority votes also. He's got black votes. He's also got uh, Latinos. Latino votes. It's also this anti-woke campaign which he has launched. And it is a fact again that the progressive democratic sections, instead of focusing on class issues, have also tended to focus on social issues. So therefore, the wokeness debate, as it were, but also the fact that uh, they haven't focused on the economy, they haven't focused strongly, for example, on the Palestine issue. In fact, uh, Bill Clinton went to one of the swing states and said, whatever is being done by Israel Justified the genocide, yeah. Ju justified the genocide is because of the Hamas. They're killing Palestinians because of Hamas, what they did a year back. So that kind of campaign also means that they have taken for granted what will the minorities do, what will the women do, they have to come to us. So we need to only focus on specific issues that we think are of interest and not take up class issues regarding the what the American working class, what you said about the Rust Belt particularly, yeah. they feel that the capitalist class has got a rain check. Of course, doesn't mean that Trump is not one of them. But that's a strange part of it, that the, the reaction to big capital in the United States then rallies towards Trump. Yeah. So how do you explain this? Yeah, so, so just before I get into this, there, is, there are two interesting things, right? Not just that Trump has crossed 277, Trump looks at this point to be sweeping all the battleground states, every one of them, right? So even the ones which haven't been called, Arizona, Michigan, and Nevada, even they are 
uh, Trump is leading in all of them. It's not just that Trump has uh, it's, it's, has crossed the 270 mark, but he's leading in all the battleground states, right? And even the, uh, so, so we already know that uh, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Georgia, um, and Wisconsin have already been declared. Out of the seven, four have been declared. Four have been declared. But the ones which haven't been declared, Michigan, Arizona, and Nevada, they are also, Trump is also leading. And, and in, for example, in Michigan and uh, Nevada, a lot of votes have already been counted. So most likely Trump is going to sweep all seven of the battleground states. The other interesting fact is that this number. So Trump is leading in the popular vote. Now, in 2016, when Trump won the elections, he lost the popular vote, right? So, so this clearly then Trump has, is claiming that it is a mandate for him, and which is clearly the case. It is a mandate for him. Now, coming to what you... Or it's sort of mandate for Kamala Harris. Yeah. Mandate against <laughs> Yeah. But um, coming to what you were saying, so it is interesting that uh, amongst Trump's main uh, campaign uh, planks, his number one campaign plan plank was the economy and inflation, right? While the Democrats had nothing to say about the economy and inflation. So, so that clearly uh, was, was a very stark difference. Trump, like b being right wing, he brought in immigration, right? So, so his, his solution to the economy was to build the wall and stop the immigrants from coming in. Uh, the Democrats ran a campaign which had no economic issues, like you said. So their main planks was one was, approach the abortion issue. Uh, the second was, well, the, actually the number one issue was democracy. So Trump coming in, like will bring in fascism, that was their number one issue. Uh, it didn't seem to be a very genuine issue given that they were supporting the genocide in, in Gaza. So, so once you are actually actively part of a genocide and then claiming the other side is fascist, it, 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 it seems- It's the age of the- Yeah, it, it seems disingenuous, right? And um, abortion, they, they um, pressed on abortion as an issue, the right, right, the, the right uh, to have an abortion. And um, their third issue, they really didn't have a third issue. The third issue was on the likability of Kamala Harris. So Kamala Harris as a candidate, you didn't know what she stood on on many of the main issues that the American people were concerned about, about the economy. She, she simply had uh, no take on these issues, right? So, for example, even on immigration, instead of pushing back on Trump's right-wing agenda, she actually, towards the end, when she, they started polling that immigration was becoming a big issue, she basically took the position which is the same as Trump, that that uh, they would um, support um, uh, uh, the ban on immigration which Trump was pr proposing. On the Ukraine, on the wars issue, like on, on Israel and Palestine, both of them are more or less similar. But on Ukraine, Trump has said that they will, he will stop the war in a day, right? Now, whether he can, he does it or not, but his rhetoric is that he's stopped the war in a day while, while Harris was clearly on the, uh, Harris's pitch was that America would be the strongest force on earth and a, a very pro militaristic stand, right? So almost trying to, outflank Trump from the right, right, which is which is the same strategy which Hillary Clinton uh, um, used and failed, right. So, so, so on one hand, on the internal domestic issues, on the pressing issues of the economy, you have nothing to say. On, uh, on the, uh, on the health insurance issue, right, the, the, the single choice issue, she had nothing to say. Uh, but on wars and uh, militarism, uh, they were trying to uh, more be more right right wing than Trump was. Uh, so so um, it kind of in a way. Well, let's let's take your foreign policy issue. Yeah. Uh, there is a difference between Kamala Harris and Trump. Trump says, "I will provide you protection. You have to pay me," which is his relationship with Europe, Western yeah. Europe. It's very clear. You pay me, I will give you protection. Otherwise. You have to increase your military budget and protect yourself or a combination of the two. So he comes across as this great protector, but at the cost of extracting his uh, money from those he, he protects. So the protection racket, in other words. In this, in this particular case, it also means much more transactional that 
I protect you, you pay me. And as far as the larger picture of the world, democracy and all of that, which from hard facts on the ground we know is really rhetoric of the US ruling classes, and they're not really serious about any of them, that there, the rhetoric of that Trump has given up and he says very much transactional. And as far as others are concerned, I have the big stick, I'll beat up people. As far as Israel comes, is, is, is an issue for him, he is totally pro-Israel as much as Biden and Kamala Harris are. Right. So there is no difference on that count as well. The only relationship was, for instance, China, which it started with Trump, the talk about sanctions, etc., and Biden has happily continued it. So he hasn't shown any difference between Trump and Biden on that count. And that's true for as, as far as Russia is concerned. Very clearly, the US policy was to defeat Russia by bankrupting them economically, the financial sanctions, which unfortunately for the United States backfired badly. And in the long run, has also weakened the dollar. So all of that taken together, Trump appears to have a position, Kamala Harris appears to have none, which differentiates her from Biden. And Biden, if he was unpopular, then not demarcating herself from Biden except to say, I'm a younger and a female version of Biden, is not really going to uh, defeat the Trump plank. That was what a lot of the people were saying, that this is an election for the Republicans not to win but the Democrats to lose. Do you think that that would be a correct way of looking at the election? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the like the major issues, right? So one was, let's say the economy, employment. Um, then on the issue of the public choice for, for health insurance, on uh, minimum wages. Um, and you would think uh, also on foreign wars, on the continuing wars. Now, if you think that these are the kind of the four main issues, if you poll the American people on these issues, they would all take positions which are left fit. Right? The, the majority of the Americans would say they want a higher minimum wage, they want the public option, they want to end the wars. But the Democrats who are supposed to be representing the labor, they take right wing positions on these issues. So at that point, the difference between the what is what the right is saying and what the left is saying to common people we will not call them the left. Uh, what what the what the the supposed left, the, the the liberals are saying, and what the right wing is saying, there is not too much difference for for the common people. Like so, here is an interesting thing. Look, look at uh, Missouri. Uh, so Missouri is deep red. Montana is deep red, right? So if you look at Missouri, uh, it's it's sweeping red, right? So so it, it, I mean this this is a, a state which Trump has won, uh, swept, right? Uh, same with, uh, if you look at Montana, uh, now this is a state, again, which is all the reds are Republicans that Trump has swept. But if you look at the ballot measures, it, there is, now this is an interesting thing. If you look at the ballot measures in Missouri, so uh, the right to abortion has passed in Missouri, right? So uh, same with uh, Montana. Again, the right to abortion has passed in Montana. So, so this this differentiation that the, 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 the red states... That's a significant number, 56.8%, yeah. almost 57%. Right. So, so this, this differentiation you have that the red states are somehow conservative, they, they are called the deplorables and... and the, that's Hillary That's Hillary Clinton. But, but even Biden said they, some derogatory term about them. But the problem is that the, on many of these issues, the American people are taking a left of center position, but the political parties are not giving them an option to vote left of center. So both, they have two right wing parties and then they decide on which one, like this, this they, in the last few elections, they've been switching back and forth because they don't have candidate to reflect their actual views on issues. So that's the issue at the third parties don't really count, like Jill Stein was expected to get a lot of protest votes, really didn't. In fact, people voted for either Trump or voted for uh, Kamala Harris. And what it did is a lot of the protest vote would have gone to Trump. So what do the people, in, when Bill Clinton says that Hamas 
is the cause of the genocide in Palestine. What does a Palestinian or an Arab person in the United States who is voting of that origin, what will he do? So these are the bigger questions. But then it comes back to the point, as you said, there is really no left firm position in the political parties. You know, if you go back in history, Democrats are also the party of slavery. Yeah. <laughs> Republican is a party of Lincoln. So this has this has not been sought anchored in positions of the two parties. They have swung back and forth. And when Roosevelt was the president, then there were the Democrat Dixie Democrats were the Southern Democrats who supported essentially supported uh, I would say slavery. But in that time there was no slavery. They were part segregation apartheid segregation. So this is the history of the United States, and we still think at least from what you're saying and what I'm saying, that the absence is a clear left of center position in these places, even which would be equivalent to what the social democracy used to be in Europe, which no longer is. They are also there. The social democracy is competing with the right to shift how much to the, to the light right they can go. Yeah. So I think those are the issues that it is not really the right versus left, liberal versus authoritarian right wing that is being posed to be. But the fact that there is no left wing position, not even a social welfare strong position that is being taken and at least limiting the concentration of the, what shall we say, the rich and the affluent, which is what the United States has become. And I think that is the significant message that the electoral seems to have sent. Now, what the consequences are for the world, that's a topic for another day. We'll finish up here with the elections and the analysis with Bappa Sinha, who is, as you know, the ones who studies the psychology of the elections as well as analyzes what the trends seem to show. Thank you very much for being with us and hope to see you in further discussions with NewsClick. And also we'll analyze at a future date. What are the implications of these elections for the rest of us?